second speaker this morning is Stephen Smale. Um, I am told that Stephen is the oldest among us at 90 years old. He re <laughs> to, to those of us who are not quite so old, he is quite an inspiration. Um, he received the Fields Medal in 1966, and if I can tell a brief anecdote, uh, this is from an article in the New York Times in 2014, How Math Got Its Nobel. You know, the Fields Medal has existed for quite a while, but it was relatively obscure. Now I'm quoting, in 1950, neither of the two recipients had heard from the award before being told that they had won it. So how did it become the Nobel Prize of Mathematics? Speaking about politics, the true story helps illuminate the often neglected intersection of mathematics and politics. In August 1966, the San Francisco Examiner reported that Stephen Smale, who had been subpoenaed to appear before the House Un-American Activities Committee in connection with his anti-Vietnam War activism, had fled to Moscow. But Mr. Smale had not fled. The subpoena hadn't even reached him, for he was already in Europe. As his colleagues hurried to clarify to the press, he was on his way to attend the International Congress of Mathematicians in Moscow, where he was to receive the Fields Medal on the day he was meant to testify. Some saw his award as evidence of communist affilities. Uh, on the other hand, the San Francisco Chronicle and the New York Times saw things differently. They credited Mr. Smale's colleague's account, quoted in the Associated Press, that he was abroad to accept mathematics' closest award to the Nobel Prize, an exaggeration that by enhancing his stature helped insulate him from criticism and elevated the prize as well. The scandal faded. So, uh, Steve, the, the floor is now yours. Thanks, Scott. <clears throat> So, uh, testing, can you hear me? Can you see me right? Just a second. I write this because it's a name I forget too easily. How does that show up? Huh? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> All right, good. So, uh, what I want to talk about today is uh, this problem of uh, how do the uh, myocytes, a big group of cells in the heart, how do they uh, coordinate to give the heartbeat in a few words. So I would like to give some background of that problem and what I'm doing on that. So. Uh, this goes, it's an old problem. It goes back to the, around 1650 to Huygens, uh, this name here, uh, who uh, looked at the problem of two uh, pendulum clocks anchored on a beam, a situation that arose from ships at that time. And after a while, the pendulums beat together. And it had to do with According to Huygens already, some diffusive force in the beam. So that's the idea. So it's kind of a diffusion uh, force on the myocytes which give, gives rise to the heartbeat. That's something, it's an old, old idea. But I talked to uh, Strogatz, who's an expert on these things uh, last year and asked him, what about the heartbeat? How's that, what's the status of that? And he says, pretty much unsolved. It's not known uh, how that works for the heart. Anyway, that helped reinforce my thinking about this. My thoughts have gone back to that subject for maybe a few decades. So let me jump uh, to Turing. Uh, from uh, Huygens, the big huge jump in time. So this was Turing's <coughs> paper 
I think maybe most of you probably know about it, at least 1952, and maybe, maybe his last paper, where uh, he was concerned about morphogenesis. Uh, in a way, he gave some examples for morphogenesis, which are uh, just the uh, other direction from which I'm looking at, because he saw morphogenesis as a break in symmetry, and I want to see how symmetry is created. Or, okay, so uh, let me go back a little bit to that work of Turing, uh, because his model is the same model that I'm using with some drastic changes. So. Uh, Turing had this picture of cells. So we have these cells, one to N, M. This is pretty literally Turing. And you have on this, each cell you have a, a force. A cell one, you have a, it's a re, you call a reactive. I would say today it's, it's a dynamical system on the state space of that cell. And then we have M of these cells, each reacting with its own dynamics. And then he puts this diffusive, diffusive force, same one that I use, uh, which would uh, have the effect of you know, making everything go in unison, but uh, he showed something which uh, I learned quite a bit of. He said, there's an example, even in this linear case, I mean, he was very naive. Everything here was uh, linear for Turing. And the, it would be absurd today to try to de de deal with a linear dynamics because periodic solution, which is stable, cannot occur in a linear system. So, in some sense, it's not surprising that biologists reject this, this, pic, this model of Turing. Uh, but he, he did something that was important, and I, I built on that 40 years ago, and it's the following. If you take uh, this linear dynamic, so then you have this diffusion, the fusion is given by a Laplacian. Uh, if you do this, what can happen is, uh, and I'll draw a little example. I'll draw an example for a periodic solution. Same things apply to a linear situation. And so the dynamics, even like this, can fail, and this is my, uh, analysis of Turing can fail to be monotone in convergence. Because the idea is when you have diffusion and you start getting away from the equilibria, the diffusion can exacerbate that so it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and you lose convergence. That's what is my language, what Turing did in that paper. And so uh, he said, we get, this leads to morphogenesis. And I would say, you know, breaks the symmetry. And uh, so anyway, that's what, I, what we call today monotonicity. Monotone. And that is a failure of this example where our, uh, solutions get farther and farther from equilibria for a period, then get back, come back, even when you have a stable equilibria. Monotonicity, we ask that convergence of the dynamics to the equilibria is monotone, always getting closer and closer. And I should say, in this talk, I have two co-workers. One is Pugh, Charles Pugh. And the other is uh, Rajapaksi, Indika. But I, I, don't, I don't give them uh, the blame for all things I say because they haven't checked, have, I haven't convinced them of everything I'm talking about today. 
But this is a joint project. It's gone on for a year. And my own uh, thinking about this has gone on for many decades. Because what I did was in a modified Turing model where I took nonlinear uh, periodic solutions, nonlinear periodic solution, uh, I, I, the ones I look at are peri periodic solutions which are stable. Things, all, all nearby solutions are tending to it. So I think my own perspective of dynamics and biology consists mainly of uh, stable periodic solutions or stable equilibria. St stable just means nearby solutions go either to the equilibria or to the periodic solution. <coughs> so that, that kind of dynamics, very simple dynamical systems or dynamics are going to have the situation where you have uh, stable equilibria or a stable periodic solution. But I'm going to make two hypotheses as we proceed. One is monotonicity, and the other is what I call, we call a hardwiring hypothesis. I'll go into that. OK. Uh, so what? 40, I think it must have been 40 or 50 years ago. I took an example of uh, these equations of Turing. Uh, two uh, stable equilibria. Uh, I, I call that sort of dead cells, where everything converged to an equilibria. And so that, that was what I, I call dead, two dead cells. But you allow a little bit of diffusion, and then you get a periodic solution, which is life. So anyway, my paper was, I, I, I called it about how you get life from these inert cells. You put them together with diffusion, and then you get a periodic solution stable. That was what I did with Turing's equations, except I use the nonlinear uh, versions. OK, and then uh, that's when I start thinking about these questions of monotonicity, because in my examples, the equilibria before I, I had the diffusion, uh, I had to demand that you have monotonicity. So the monotonicity prevented uh, this Turing example and allowed failure of monotonicity allowed me to get this periodic solution in the two-cell two case. So in our whole work, now we're going to be assuming about our equilibria and our periodic solutions, we have this hypothesis of monotonicity. And uh, these previous work shows that it's necessary. So we have this axiom of uh, monotonicity. OK, uh, so I'm just going to try today not to give a very complete picture, but just some of the issues that come up in the, this picture we have of uh, synchrony, uh, which would lead uh, our system of cells in the heart to create a heartbeat. So they all come in, 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 in synchrony. And there's this famous example that has been important for me. Uh, it's a, I don't know, it's the kind of example I like. It's if you take these myocytes, these main cells in the heart that are responsible for the heartbeat, if you put the, the myocytes in a Petri dish suitably, then you can see them beating individually, uncoordinated. But after a while, those that are very close will become beating in unison. Uh, they're synchronized. So the idea is you can have two cells with periodic solutions like this, and they have 
different uh, initial points, they have different phases, so they're not coordinated. And the idea is to get these periodic solutions of the individual cells to coordinate through having the same uh, phase, or the same initial conditions after a while, after, the t after some time. That's the whole thing to do, and that's why we use the hypotheses of monotonicity and uh, the other mon uh, story is hard hardwiring. So what's hardwiring for us? And this I did uh, we, with a paper with uh, Andika Rajapaks, and we did this in a paper that was published a year or two ago. So we know that the, in the DNA of uh, people, for example, is pretty much the same. It doesn't change. And uh, even in the same tissue, same organ, it's even more so. The DNA is the same. But uh, for different tissues, liver or heart, there is a, uh, some somewhat differences in, the, in that uh, DNA, especially in the interactions. So what we say is hard wiring is not only within a tissue do you have the same uh, DNA, but you have the same dynamics. <laughs> That's what we call hard wiring. So in all the heart cells, you'll have the same dynamics, all the myocytes. Or in, the, uh, in any tissue, uh, you have the DNA, which is the active part, is uh, going to have this property of being the same dynamics, not uh, necessarily a coordinated, but the same dynamical system. So uh, this is the second main hypothesis we use now is hard wiring. Okay, so those are the two more or less new, new axioms we're putting into the subject of synchronization to get our model for the heartbeat. Hard wiring means the myocytes, which are the cause of uh, the beat, they will all have be the same dynamics, but not necessarily synchronized. And we all assume that uh, the periodic solutions in each of the uh, cells is monotone. So these are the things we're assuming. And from that, we want to see, and we do, are pretty much able to understand the dynamics of these, of this system, of the myocytes together with uh, uh, diffusive force, like the Laplacian. Okay. So, let, let me give a, uh, a main stage in this development. So these equations, which uh, in some respect go back to Turing, you'll have uh, the dynamics of a single cell, say cell I, will have a dynamics X of T. Uh, X of T now is going to be, uh, it could be two, two things. One is a stable equilibrium or a stable periodic solution. For a case of myocytes, this would be a periodic solution. Pictorially, I draw it this way. This is a solution of the dynamics, stable in the sense that nearby ones all tend to it. So this, for a single cell, is the beat of, a, of that dynamics. In the uh, space is going to be you know, the state of that cell. You could think of it as I think the best way to think about it is a mixture of proteins and, and some, maybe some other chemicals which interact with each other to give a oscillation. So that, that's one of the ingredients is the uh, 
dynamics of the cell. These equations in some contexts are called reactive diffusion equations. So the reaction part is going to be in each cell, you have this uh, dynamics, which is an oscillation in our case. And we have, for all each myocyte, we have the same dynamical system. And then they, uh, they have a diffusion force, uh, which has a tendency to synchronize the system. Now, the, this is a, comes from computer science. So in a way, that con computer science and dynamical systems combine somewhat in our picture. So I say Laplacian. This is the Laplacian. It comes up in a, a lot of different contexts. Classically, harmonic analysis is study of solutions with the Laplacian equation. Uh, but also it comes up in computer science by taking a, a, a graph. So we use a graph, Laplacian. So the graph Laplacian, uh, you could think of as uh, some kind of graph like this, where they, the nodes represent the cells in this system of myocytes. So the, uh, the ver vertices are the cells. And the edges are diffus diffusions between the cells, uh, dynamics which would tend to equalize, but linear, they can be linear. And so the graph Laplacian then is this finite object. And it's built from an adjacency matrix A, AIJ, so the I and J are the different nodes or the different cells, and AIJ is an interaction between those two uh, cells, interactive force between the two. So this is a matrix. Uh, so computer science take it symmetric. The computer science prefer integers. We prefer num real numbers, non-negative real numbers. And then you can think of the AIJ is being measured in terms of a, a membrane between two cells, which allows the diffusion. So the AIJ represents something like the physics between the cells. Linear, though. And then you form the Laplacian, as computer scientists do too, by simply taking uh, some row sum diagonal matrix plus or minus A. This is a familiar object to computer science, except we're using real numbers for the A's. OK, so then our equations then will combine uh, this reaction. This is going to be fi fixed I. You will have this reactive Dynam dynamics, which has to do with chemical reactions or electrical reactions within, within each cell. And then we have between the cells, we have the XI joined by this matrix, the Laplaci Laplacian matrix. And this is, all these are finite number of cells and the finite number of uh, vertices and edges. So this is why it's in some ways closer to computer science than to the physics or continuous mathematics. OK, so this is beginnings of a model for the heartbeat for us. So the heartbeat then would take these individual attracting periodic solutions and join them, so to speak, by this Laplacia diffusion term, and that will give us some kind of model in the direction of, of getting the synchrony. And that's where we have to assume, especially the monotonicity on the individual periodic solutions and hard wiring, which says that they're the same dynamics for each eye. So all the cells are the same cell type among them 
myocytes of the heart. Myocytes are roughly half our heart cells. The rest of them are maybe more fixed structural cells. But there is this class of cells called the myocytes, which are responsible for the beating. And they uh, will have the, this reaction, which is periodic. And moreover, this periodic solution here is the same for every cell. That's almost a definition of uh, cells of a tissue. The, in a tissue in the human body, the cells uh, are supposedly of the same cell type, which means uh, they have the same dynamics. But not, they're not the same initial conditions. And so the same initial conditions is going to be accounted for by this diffusion term here. So we have the reaction term and the diffusion term. And putting them together, we get the uh, dynamics. And we're assuming now the two axioms. One is monotonicity, and the other is the hardwiring that says that not only are the, uh, these uh, proteins the same, but they have the same dynamics in a, in a cell type of a tissue. OK, so that's, to some extent, that's almost a, cl a closed picture. So we can analyze this, and we see with these hypotheses that we get the following, that uh, what will happen is a convergence. Here's now the cell, cell one times cell two, cell M. In this space, for the, for the dynamics to take place, product of the M cells, these could be uh, the, then the each Euclidean space. Uh, the, so this would be our space of the dynamics. And then you'd have a diffusion between the cells like this Laplacian. So the Laplacian is the dynamics between cells. And uh, this reaction term is within a single cell. And it says how the D uh, RNA, DNA, or the, if you want, the proteins change in time. And the fact that each in each cell, you, uh, myocytes, you do see in the Petri dish, you do, do see an oscillation. And when you put them together, then you'll get a, with the Laplacian, you'll get the, the uh, synchrony. So that's the, the first part of the story. Now, the literature and the interest goes way beyond what I've just said. There's uh, something called Kuramoto equation. So Kuramoto works with the phases, theta 1, theta m. So these are angles, angles that go from 0 to 2 pi uh, for each cell. And they will be determined by our picture here of, the, uh, of this common periodic solution. They will give rise to the thetas in a way which we have to do a lot of uh, analysis to, to give the relations to the uh, theta space from what I've just described, as, which is the big Euclidean space. Th a theta space, then these angles, this is a torus it's of m dimensions. I call it Tm. So this would be the state in the phase representation. And that's what Kuramoto suggests. Uh, and then, so there is a dynamics induced on the uh, torus, and it's, uh, 
for each of the xi's, it's going to have a circle, and this would be a parameter i, so you have theta i in the i cell. It's just a point on this periodic solution, which is this, the limit in time of the dynamics. Okay, so what we want to do is understand this picture, dynamics on the torus, which I've just roughly indicated. And then we want to look at that picture of the theta i's and see how the theta i's initially will be quite different at time zero for all the different coordinates. But as uh, time gets bigger and bigger, because of the diffusion term, one could expect these to all coalesce about the same point, and that's the synchrony. And this is going to, dynamics is going to come into this Kuramoto picture on this torus. So that's what, what we have to do. In the passage uh, from the Laplacian picture where we have the interpretation in terms of cell membranes, here we don't have any of that. With the, phases. This could be a phase for each protein, for example, but separately. So there is a lot here, which I'm not really, uh, I can't really get into here, but so uh, then what happens with these initial conditions, if we go over I, they will all coalesce to the same point in general according eventually the Kuramoto equations. Kuramoto equations are uh, a carryover from the Laplacian that I described uh, already. The Laplacian is a diffusion term. Kuramoto equations are the diffusion picture, and you can express it, and what we do is express, take a potential V on the theta i, theta i minus theta j. This would be sine squared over 2. This is our potential, uh, which is squared. And then we look at the gradient of that. So we can interpret Kuramoto's equations as a gradient of this potential. So it's a potential function like uh, one uses in physics all the time, is a look at the solutions of minus uh, the potential to see the solutions converge to a common, to a common phase. Uh, okay, so, yeah, this is, uh, it gets a little more complicated because what we do eventually is to get a complete picture of the dynamics here. Get a complete dynamical picture. And that uh, says what happens to every solution in our n-dimensional space on the torus. And it involves Morse theory. So we use a Morse theory to inspire a decomposition of these spaces with this potential up here. And the Morse theory will help us understand this complete dynamical picture for this Kuramoto flow, which eventually gives us a picture on the phases. And so we've done that for the uh, phase picture on the torus. Well, uh, we've already passed from the Euclidean picture on the xi's so originally that graph Laplacian to the torus picture. And on the torus, then we uh, are able to use more theory to get the whole dynamics from one end to the other, you know, the maximum, the minima, and the saddle points, and see how they connect by what you would expect from Morse theory, and using the Morse theory for the function G, V up there. <coughs> so anyway, that's a little bit the, of the way this whole picture goes. I think maybe I'll stop here, though. Thanks very much.
Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, do we have any questions? Questions? Comments? Here. So do you actually still get synchrony if the, uh, in the different cells they want to move at slightly different speeds? Oh, they don't change the speed because of this uh, hard wiring. They all have the same speed in the same dynamical system, different uh, phases or different initial points. Yeah, but if you change the model a little bit to make yeah. the speed slightly different for each yeah. cell, if and they actually still synchronize, do you actually, you know, do you get some kind of effective speed at which it moves <laughs> and still have synchrony? Or yeah, you, you probably could, but we didn't do that. No, no then we just take, a, you know, synchronize the phase. And because if you have, a, you know, 100 million cells all uh, built the same way, then uh, the, the speed and things like that, it's not hard to imagine they would be the same. Yeah, the higher I don't think the speed of the uh, dynamics along a peri period is going to be, be significantly different between the different ce cells in the heart, the myocytes. Anyway, that's uh, the way, what we, what we do. One more question. No? Okay, let's thank the speaker again.